Share my screen. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to speak about um, a workshop that actually did not occur, uh, but I'm happy to share the idea behind that workshop and hopefully we'll have other times when we can uh, do this work. The, the workshop was intended to de demonstrate how the COVIC uh, database, this collection of online visualizations related to the pandemic can be used to create sets of visualizations around a, quite a number of themes and subjects and focuses. This is a, a brief list of some of the um, sets of material that we can pull out. There's many, many visualizations on aerosol transmission. I'm working on a fairly long article on death milestones, how vaccines work, vaccine status. <clears throat> the collection uh, can be used to describe how designers could use the use many different strategies to visualize similar information sets. As you've heard from uh, a number of the speakers already today, there's a lot of different principles out there uh, and there's not one way to make visualizations. So we, we what we have here is I think a, a unique collection of variety of ways of approaching that. And if you think about some of the issues for general audience, such as uh, what Kent was speaking at, was speaking about before. Um, how do you communicate uh, to a very general audience on public health and medical information? And in this collection, we could certainly find numerous ways of dealing with things as now as simple to think about as hand washing, social distancing, mask wearing, disease symptoms. There's really an enormous variety of ways of doing this. So that's what we, would, what we had hoped to do with the workshop, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do a workshop like this again sometime soon. But let me explain what it's based on. Uh, the COVIC collection, COVIC stands for COVID-19 Online Visualization Collection, is available on this public website. And uh, essentially it's a, uh, it's a collection that we began in March of 2020. Uh, it collects articles and classifies figures from those articles, and we continue to do that today. Uh, we've got one major article that will be out in the journal Design Issues in the fall, uh, which describes some of the theory behind this and how we hope it will be a basis for uh, different kinds of design research and teaching. Uh, the collection contains images that appeared online from any web page that sought to explain any aspect of the pandemic using an information visualization of any kind. And this is the basic statistics as of today. We've got about 13,000 figures. Uh, these are from about 3,000 uh, <clears throat> 3, page images from about 3,500 articles. And this is the, the histogram of distribution of when these things were published. Obviously there was a tremendous amount published during the, the first couple of months and there's been a very steady stream of material since then. What we collect in is uh, the articles themselves with a set of metadata on the publisher, language, country, the type of source and when it's published. And we are also collecting each individual figure and then we're adding metadata to those figures, chart type, and so forth. And uh, we collect a page image for each article. And then we separately collect the images of the figures themselves so they can be classified separately. We're looking at both qualitative and quantitative visualizations. I know a lot of the discussion today has been about uh, Qualita uh, quantitative data visualization, but we're also looking at, uh, quanti at qualitative. So quantitative, such as these dumbbell charts and, and stacked area charts and so forth, but also uh, visualizations that are designed to explain scientific and social aspects of the pandemic, flow charts, drawings, different types of scientific illustration. And we're collecting both static figures like the one you see on the left and for many of them, in order to really convey how they work, we've recorded them as MP4s, as videos, so you can see the interaction. 
So we got 11 subject categories. Uh, the most common are medical magnitude or supplies, that's vaccines and masks. But we also have a lot of information about articles that are focused on the social and on the environmental and economic aspects of the pandemic. And uh, in terms of the source types, uh, the majority of it, a little bit more than 50%, is uh, news media, but we also have a lot of material from peer reviewed journals, from governmental and NGOs. And in terms of the visualization types, we've got about 30 different visualization types. Uh, the most common are line and bar charts. We've got about 2,000 maps. And I'll be giving a talk at the uh, at the David Rumsey Map Center at Stanford uh, at the end of June, talking about some of those maps. And we have an enormous number of scientific illustrations. So from that website, you can get to the COVID visualizer. The visualizer allows you to search by article and filter by article attributes and figure attributes so that you can access any of these and you can look at just the publications from one country or in one particular language or pick all of the all of the examples from one particular chart. Uh, and then you can examine each one of these figures uh, and you can look at the figures within an article. You can view the page that the article is on and you can follow that link to uh, the page if it's available. One of the reasons we're doing this is that a lot of this material is ephemeral. It's not necessarily online anymore. And also much of it is behind different types of paywalls. So being able to capture this gives us an opportunity to keep it in a place where people can use it for education, educational purposes and research. So I'll just leave you with this uh, list of URLs. The website is covic-archive.org. The visualizer is accessible from there. It's a Heroku app. And there is also a, a GitHub repository for the visualizer if anyone is interested in looking at the source code. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if we have questions from the audience. Uh, hi, Paul. This is uh, Joel. Hello. Uh, hi, Joel. Hi. I'd like to ask if, you s if you've seen um, a change in the types of visualization throughout the time of these two years. Um, have, like, you know, flattening the curve. I remember that started, we saw that a lot at the beginning of the pandemic, and we haven't seen that after a year or so. So did the charts types change throughout time? Um. The subjects have changed somewhat. There, essentially, there are a few subjects that were very common for a few months, such as flattening the curve, uh, and they've essentially disappeared. Uh, but the most common forms of the visualizations have stayed fairly similar across time. Line charts and bar charts, histograms, uh, are as common now as they were before. I would say that the bubble map versus the chloropleth map, uh, the chloropleth maps have become totally dominant at this point. There's relatively few bubble maps, but I think that a lot of that has to do with the density of the data. Early in the pandemic, there were ways of showing, showing information that uh, simply aren't possible now when you're dealing with uh, the kind of scale of numbers that we have after now three years. I would just I'd observe, observe one thing, which is that in the last three months, there has been a big, uh, a big change in the number of news stories about the pandemic that use visualizations. There are far fewer stories that use visualizations and I think that's essentially because uh, many of the places where the pandemic is uh, affecting many, many people, uh, there's almost no data available. Um, another question. Hi. Hi, Paul. This is Mushan here. Yeah. Um, so 
I find I find your uh, archive fascinating, and uh, I think we can't state enough how this is like pr probably the most uh, fundamental thing that happened to data visualization in hi in history. That every day we started to look at the world through data visualization. Um, I'm I wonder if you've noticed any um, kind of global influence. Like have have we seen um, kind of COVID, vi COVID visualization memes um, going throughout the world, uh, things coming only from the West to other places, but, uh, or, or have you seen um, thi things that are coming from, uh, from less prominent places and then copied in our, I th throughout the world? Like any, any, any flow of influ influence, um, c kind of, contagious of uh, contagion of uh, data viz? So uh, that, that's a really good question, and I think that would be a great research project. Uh, we, could, we could contribute material to anyone who would like to answer that question. Uh, I, can, I can speculate from having looked at a lot of material that uh, the New York Times has a lot of influence around the world. So many people in many different news organizations become aware of the kind of visualizations that are published in the New York Times there's there are certainly a num there are certainly several examples that we have where uh, newspapers in other parts of the world have adapted things that they saw in the New York Times and acknowledged that you know that this was inspired by something that came from there, uh, in particularly in Western Europe. Uh, I've seen a lot of similarity among uh, material published in Singapore and Hong Kong and the UK. And I assume that that's because the people in those three uh, cultural areas pay a lot of attention to one another and come from you know, a lot of common, uh, common references. Uh, but it's harder for me to look at the material from South America and from uh, uh, South Asia and have a perspective on how different the visualizations are that are being presented about uh, the pandemic, how different those are than what may have been published, you know, five or 10 years ago in the same, uh, in the same areas, because I'm just not familiar with the, the styles there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul, for this talk. And uh, I, I hope you won't need to add many more <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to yes. the side that we are done with the COVID. Uh, but uh, thank you, and I'm sure that you, your site will be resourceful to many researchers in the future. Thank okay. you, thank, well, you, thank very you very much for joining thank us. Thanks for the opportunity.